Okay, so now the recording has started, so we can begin. We'll start with the three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then I'll do just one time the salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay, good morning, everybody. And now we've switched from summer mode to the autumn here in New York. And now we are continuing our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Fives. And now we come to Sutta number 26, which it has the short title, Liberation, but it's actually, the theme is actually the basis of liberation. And in the last class that we had, I, when we had about five or 10 minutes left, I started the sutta, then I realized that it requires too much discussion to fit into just five or 10 minutes. So decided to postpone it for today's class. Okay, so this the theme of the sutta are five bases of liberation. And what is meant by a base of liberation that's indicated by the next clause. It's a means by which here we have the case of a monk dwelling, heedful, ardent, and resolute. So by this means, his unliberated mind becomes liberated, his undestroyed asavas or taints are utterly destroyed, and he reaches the unsurpassed security from bondage that he had not previously reached. And so a key expression here to understand how these bases of liberation operate or function is I highlighted this phrase that one is dwelling heedful, ardent, and resolute. So it's not, for example, that you just listen to a teacher give a discourse on the Dhamma, or you teach the Dhamma yourself, and then suddenly your mind gets liberated. But you have to be regularly, like fully committed to the practice of the, of the path. So that's what's meant by dwelling heedful, ardent, and resolute. So these are words that signify, that indicate the presence of such qualities as maintaining mindfulness in one's everyday life, applying oneself energetically to removing unwholesome states of mind and cultivating wholesome states of mind, cle maintaining clear awareness or clear comprehension when engaged in all of one's ordinary activities and regularly devoting oneself to the development of the higher qualities of uh, serenity and insight, calm and insight, samatha and vipassana. And so when one has that background momentum through these practices of ardent energy, mindfulness, clear comprehension, dedication to some to concentration and insight, then one has built up a kind of momentum or potential. It's like a pile of dry leaves. And if somebody just throws a match into the pile of dry leaves, then the leaves will catch fire and will catch the flame and then a fire will flare up. And so that is building up the equipment, we call this the equipment, the requisites of realization. And then when those requisites have been accumulated, the equipment have, has been acquired, then sometimes it's just a slight event that is sufficient to trigger the realization and liberation. And this is speaking particularly about the final destruction of the asavas. So you know, in the early Buddhist texts, they speak about four stages of attainment, stream entry, 
which is the initial stage where you gain the first penetrative insight into the truth of the Dhamma. And at the stage of stream entry, there are still seven, at most seven more lives to go. So one's only eliminated the lower fetters, the coarser fetters or bonds. Then beyond that is the stage of once returner, the next major breakthrough, which doesn't eradicate any defilements, but it weakens greed, hatred, and delusion, and reduces the number of future rebirths to one or possibly two in the human realm or in one of the celestial realms. Then the third stage is the stage of the non-returner, the third breakthrough in which one eliminates completely sensual craving and ill will. The two fetters that bind one to the desire realm of existence. And with that, one is assured of rebirth in one of the divine realms, the Brahma world. And there one gains final liberation. And then the fourth and final stage is the stage of arhatship in which one utterly destroys all of the bonds and fetters, all of those that remain. And so the expression here that one's undestroyed asavas are utterly destroyed indicates that what is being spoken of here is the stage of arhatship. But actually, I think these five bases of liberation could apply to any of the four stages of attainment. Okay, but it's important to bear in mind that what underlies these, the five bases that are going to be explained, in each case, the practitioner is dwelling heedful, ardent, and resolute. I think the Pali expressions are heedful is Bhamatta. Tapi Pahitatta. Okay, so the first, so here the teacher and the word indicated that's translated as teacher is a word that's used in Buddhism exclusively to refer to the Buddha. The Buddha alone is the Sattā the teacher with a capital T, the founder of the teaching. And of course, this refers to a period when the Buddha is alive in the world. But then we have the alternative is a fellow monk, or in the case of women, it can be a nun, in the position of a teacher. So we could say anybody who is in the position of a teacher is teaching the Dhamma to the listener. And then in whatever way that teacher is teaching the Dhamma in just that way. Okay, the first stage here is one experiences, and this was a difficult expression to translate. So I translated one experiences inspiration in the meaning and inspiration in the Dhamma. Now I have a substantial note on this. Whoops, no, we don't want 6,000 times. Yeah, the, the key terms here are Atta Pati Sang Vedi, which is translated as experiencing inspiration in the meaning, and then Dhamma Pati Sangvedi, experiencing inspiration in the Dhamma. Then the commentary explains Atta Pati Sangvedi to mean one knowing the meaning of the text, and Dhamma Pati Sangvedi as one knowing the text. But I have to say, I don't really agree very much with this explanation. And sort of the key in this expression, the word which maybe gives the hint to the meaning 
is Vedi. And Vedi, what makes it difficult to translate is that, okay, the word Veda is connected both with knowledge and with feeling. And so this is a case where one has some knowledge or understanding, but that understanding is also accompanied by a feeling. And in this case, it's a feeling of upliftment, of elation, of sort of bordering on joy. So I found the maybe the English word which comes closest to combining some idea of understanding and upliftment of the mind is inspiration. And then what is the relationship of atta or meaning and dhamma? It's really difficult to give a definite answer to that question. Because first the word translated as meaning in Pali, whoops, in Pali is atta. Which has several meanings. One meaning, actually three major meanings at least. One meaning of the word atta is meaning. So the meaning of a statement is the atta of that statement. So that's the way it's translated here. But atta can also signify the goal. And the goal of the teaching, the purpose of the teaching is atta. So you could have also said that, what, that he experiences inspiration in the goal. And then the third meaning of atta is good or benefit, sort of the, so the, the purpose of something, the goal of something is to achieve good or benefit. So there are these different shades of meaning of the word atta. And when you translate, you have to make some, in English, you have to make some choice amongst them. And then we have the word Dhamma, which I just left untranslated. But exactly the relationship of Atta and Dhamma, it's not so clear. And I'm not sure that I agree with the commentary that Atta is the meaning of a text and Dhamma is the text itself. But in any case, this inspiration arises as one is listening to the Dhamma being taught by a teacher. And as one gains that inspiration, joy arises. Then from joy comes a strengthening of joy is piti, rapt, which translated here is rapture. So we don't have a good So rapture arises, and then when the mind is filled with rapture, then the body, it's actually both the physical body and the mind, both of them become tranquil. They settle down, sort of the disturbances, coarseness, um, a little commotion, bodily commotion, mental commotion settles down. And then with the tranquilizing of body and mind, then there comes sukha, translated here as pleasure, but it's a pleasant feeling, even we could say blissful feeling or a happy feeling. And then based on that pleasant feeling, the mind becomes concentrated. So this is indicating the achievement of samadhi but strangely, it doesn't go beyond samadhi. It goes right on to speak about this as the first base of liberation. But 
Samadhi itself is not sufficient to bring liberation. Probably what you would have to say is that based on the samadhi, one then gains the knowledge and insight into things as they actually are. And then it's through that knowing and seeing things as they actually are that one attains liberation. In fact, we saw that in a sutta that I took Yeah, I think this is Sutta number 24. Yeah, so here we start off with virtuous behavior or sila. Then based on virtuous behavior, we go to samadhi. Then from samadhi, we go to the knowledge and vision of things as they really are. That leads to disenchantment and dispassion. And then comes the knowledge and vision of liberation. So we could see that in this sutta, the subsequent stages have been sort of elated, though they should be brought in to get a complete picture. I'm I was thinking of some cases where a teacher is teaching the Dhamma to it could be a monk or any kind of practitioner, and they gain this insight, liberating insight into the Dhamma. One case, it's not the stage of our hardship, but the stage of stream entry is the first realization by Sariputta. Before Sariputta became a follower of the Buddha, he was a wandering ascetic. And he had traveled all over northern India looking for a teacher who could show him the way to the deathless, to the deathless state. And he visited teacher after teacher. Nobody could really satisfy his quest. But he was staying with another teacher named Sanjaya together with his friend Mogalana. And they had made an agreement between them, Sariput and Mogalana. Whoever finds the way to the deathless first will, teach, will share it with the others. And so one day when Sariputta was going on his arms round, he encountered a bhikkhu, a monk, one of the first disciples of the Buddha named Asaji, walking on his arms round. And as soon as he saw him, he was very impressed by the manner of Asaji, walking very calmly, mindfully, peacefully, going from house to house. And he thought, let me question this, this monk. And so he waited until Asaji had collected his alms food, finished his meal. And then he approached him and he said, please. He first asked him, who is your teacher and what is the teaching that you're following? And Asaji said, my teacher is the sage of the Sakyan clan, um, the one that we call the Buddha, the enlightened one, and it's his teaching that I follow. And then Sariputta said, please tell me his teaching, let me know his teaching. And Asaji said, he was very modest, though he was an arahant already, but very modest, he said, I've just newly come to this teaching. I can't really explain it clearly in detail. And Sariputta said, I don't need details, just give me the essence. And then Asaji recited just a four line stanza. He said, whatever dhammas there are that arise from a cause, the Tathagata, the Buddha, has explained the cause and also their cessation. That is what the great sage proclaims. And as soon as Sariputta heard that verse, he made the breakthrough to the first stage of enlightenment, the stage of stream entry. So even though the text doesn't tell us this, but as he was listening, probably very quickly, he went through these stages of inspiration in the meaning and the Dhamma, joy, rapture, tranquility, pleasure, and some kind of concentration probably an instantaneous concentration. And then wisdom arose, 
penetrating into the truth of the Dhamma. Okay, so this is the first base of liberation. When you're listening to the teaching delivered by a teacher, and I have to say, you know, we've sat through hundreds of Dhamma talks <laughs> and maybe we've gotten some inspiration and in the meaning inspiration in the Dhamma, but it's quite another matter to go through all of these stages and reach the point where the unliberated mind is liberated. So it takes a lot of sort of, I call this a kind of background accumulation of the appropriate qualities. It's like the fuel in the fuel tank. And so as soon as you turn in your car, you turn the ignition on, then the ignition catches and the car is ready to, to move. Okay, the second base of liberation. So in this case, we don't have somebody as a, in the teacher teaching the Dhamma to the monk, but the monk himself is teaching the Dhamma to others in detail as he has heard it and learned it. And then as he is teaching, as the person is teaching, then one experiences that sort of inspiration in the meaning and inspiration in the Dhamma arise. And then from that, the whole sequence unfolds, joy, rapture, tranquility, bliss, and the mind becomes concentrated in samadhi. So the second, so the, the different point here is that you yourself are teaching the Dhamma to others. It says in detail as one has heard it and learned it. You know, one example of this, a good example of this, is in the Kemaka Sutta. This is a sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya. It's chapter 22, sutta number 89. There's a monk named Kemaka who is ill and Yeah, the monks send a messenger to him saying, even though you're ill, please don't be upset or dejected by your illness. And then Kamika sends back the message. He says, even though I'm ill, but I don't see any self in relation to the five aggregates. Um, so he sends that message back to the other monks, and then the other monks come to the conclusion, ah, you don't see a self in relation to the five aggregates, so you must be an arhat. But then Kamika says, no, I'm not an arhat, though I don't see a self in relation to the five aggregates, I still am not yet free from the notions of I and mine. And the monks can't understand this. And so finally, Kamika goes to the monks himself leaning on his stick because he's been ill and he explains to the other monks how even though you elim have eliminated the view of a self you still can have attachment to the notions of i and mine and while he's giving that discourse and illustrating it with some similes his own mind and the minds of the other monks are all liberated from the taints and they all achieve our hardship in the course of that discourse. So in this way, while Kamaka is teaching the Dhamma to others, his mind becomes liberated in that process. And so this is when you're teaching the Dhamma to others. Okay, the third case is you're not teaching the Dhamma to others, you're, you're not listening to the Dhamma taught by others, not teaching to others, but you're reciting the Dhamma in detail as you heard it and learned it. And so this is a very important practice in traditional Buddhism, particularly because in ancient times, there were not printed books, so you can't be reading the Dhamma, but the way that you impress the Dhamma upon the mind, the way you can build it up and accumulate 
the teachings in the mind is by reciting the Dhamma over and over. So in that way, the Dhamma becomes stored up and becomes part of one's mental equipment. And so as you're reciting the Dhamma, as you've heard it, as you, you learned it, you start to maybe to investigate the Dhamma. And as you're investigating it, then you get the inspiration and the meaning and inspiration in the Dhamma. And when that happens, then joy arises, rapture, and so on. The whole sequence unfolds. So this is through reciting the Dhamma. Yeah, I'm trying to think of any cases that come to mind from the suttas of somebody who gains the final goal by reciting the Dhamma. They don't come to mind right now, but there must have been cases. And in any case, when you recite the Dhamma, even if you're not going to gain liberation, but it brings great inspiration from the meaning and inspiration in the teaching itself, even though you've recited this teaching over and over, but as you do so, it gives some kind of joy, spiritual nourishment to the mind. Because you could see that the words of the sutras are so well expressed, so methodical, often so detailed and systematic in their analysis. And that brings a kind of deepening of faith in the Buddha as the supreme teacher, faith and conviction in the Dhamma as the swakato, the well-articulated, well-formulated teaching. And so that brings a kind of nourishment to the mind, which can trigger this inspiration and elation. So that's the third base of liberation. And then we come to the fourth, so we have none of the other three cases, but in the fourth case, one ponders, examines, and mentally inspects the Dhamma as one has heard it and learned it. So in this case, you're using intellectual reflection to deeply examine the teaching. And this would apply particularly to those teachings that lay out the material for the um, arising of panya, of wisdom. For example, these would be the teachings on the five aggregates or the dependent origination or the six sense bases. And so you examine and mentally inspect the Dhamma. And as you do so, that mental investigation and examination, ex exploration, it's not yet the practice of actual insight meditation, but you're intellectually reflecting on the teaching, but not just in a purely academic or scholarly way, but you're trying to constantly use your understanding of the teaching in order to see into the workings of your own experience, to understand your own experience in the light of the Dhamma. And so one way that I sort of recommend for doing this in practice as part of your meditation practice is to use the reflection on non-self to examine the five aggregates so this is not a higher type of vipassana practice, but you just go mentally through, through each of the five aggregates, ascribing to each aggregate the characteristic of being, this is not mine, this is not I, this is not myself. And so one starts off with, the physical body. So we have such a strong identification with the physical body. And so when reflects, this body is not mine, not I, not myself. And you could elaborate upon that um, 
conceptually seeing how the body has gone through so many changes from infancy up through youth, middle age, for some people, old age. And so you get the sense of the impermanence, the constant change of the body, so it can't be I or mine. Then you go to feelings, feelings arising and passing, pleasant, painful, neutral feelings. And just reflect these feelings, not mine, they're not I, not myself. And then the third aggregate, usually we translate as perceptions, but we could just, for this purpose, it's, I find it more effective to use the term ideas. The ideas that I have, because we usually cling to our ideas and think those are my ideas, my interpretations, my way of understanding. So it must be true, correct, better than that of others. But then we examine our ideas and think, my ideas, not mine, not I, not myself. And then our projects are, this is the sankara kanda, the volitional activities, what we are planning to do, what we're engaged in, our activities, our hopes and expectations, all of that we bundle together and reflect this too, not mine, not I, not myself. And then you could take even the most basic fundamental awareness that illuminates all other, the entire objective field and all of our mental activities. This is the aggregate of consciousness and reflect even consciousness is not mine, not I, not myself. So in this way, you're using just intel conceptual reflection and examination, using that in the light of the Dhamma in order to build up the sense of the selfless nature of the aggregates. And that could again lead to this inspiration, joy, rapture, and so on. Okay, so that's the fourth base of liberation. Then we come to the fifth base of liberation. And so in this case, the text says that, so at first it discounts the other four, the earlier four, and then it says that the practitioner has grasped well a certain object of concentration the Pali word here is samadhi nimitta. Attended to it well, sustained it well, supported it well, and penetrated it well with wisdom. And then as one does so, in just that way, one experiences the inspiration and the meaning, inspiration and the Dhamma, and so on. <laughs> And then the mind becomes concentrated, and that's the fifth basis of liberation by which the unliberated mind is liberated. So it seems if, if the way I would understand this, okay, first one gains an object of concentration. So the Pali expression samadhi nimitta I don't think that this necessarily means that the text here is using the word nimitta in the way the word nimitta is used in the commentaries or work like the Visuddhi Magga to mean the visualized object of mental absorption, of meditative absorption, but rather it refers to any kind of object that one is uses, using as the basis for concentration. And so, one uses that object, one gains some degree of samadhi, concentration based on that object. And then one examines that object closely and then penetrates it with wisdom, which means that one would be seeing into the conditioned nature of that object, that that object has been produced 
arisen through conditions, because it's arisen through conditions, sustained by conditions, when those conditions cease, the object itself will cease. And so the object is impermanent. Then from impermanence, one goes to dukkha, unsatisfactory, and then to anatta, non-self. And so that in that way, one penetrates the object with wisdom. And as one penetrates it with wisdom, then all of the other stages unfold. Okay, so this takes care of the sutta on the five bases of liberation. And now what I want to do is to jump to a later sutta. We'll take questions later, but I want to jump to a later sutta, sutta which provides an interesting contrast to this one. Because if you just read this sutta on its own uh, superficially and you don't pay close attention to all of the wording, especially the wording about dwelling heedful, ardent, and resolute, you think, oh, not really necessary to practice formal meditation. I can just listen to discourses by others, or if I'm knowledgeable, I could give discourses. I, I myself can give teachings to others, or I could recite suttas, and in that way I can gain liberation. And so there's another sutta that comes later in the same chapter. Yeah, this one is sutta number 73, book of five, number 73. The theme is one who dwells in the Dhamma. Dhamma Vihari. It could be, this could be translated one who dwells in the Dhamma, who lives in the Dhamma, or one who lives by the Dhamma, one who dwells, yeah, one who dwells, lives by the Dhamma. And so a monk comes and says, in what way is a monk one who dwells in the Dhamma? Okay, so here the Buddha first, he gives the case of a monk who learns the Dhamma in all the different aspects. He learns it well, and he passes the day learning the Dhamma, but neglects seclusion, doesn't go off into seclusion, and does not devote himself to internal serenity of mind. So this is... Cheto Samatha. So this is the calming of the mind, the practice that leads to samadhi. And so the Buddha says, this is one who is absorbed in learning, but not one who dwells in the Dhamma. So to dwell in the Dhamma, sort of one of the requisites is to be devoted to internal serenity of mind. Okay, then we have the second case. So you see that this almost echoes the sutta that we just read on the basis of, of liberation. So here we have a monk who teaches the Dhamma to others in detail as he has heard it and learned it. And he passes the day conveying the Dhamma to others, you know, communicating the Dhamma. But again, he neglects seclusion and does not devote himself to calming the mind, to concentrating the mind. So this monk is not dwelling heedful, ardent, and resolute, but he's somewhat negligent. And so this is called a monk who is absorbed in communication, a communication expert, but not one who dwells in the Dhamma. Okay, then we have the third case. The monk is one who recites the Dhamma in detail as he has heard it and learned it, just like the monk in the sutta on the basis of liberation. But this one passes the whole day in recitation. 
and he neglects seclusion and doesn't devote himself to internal calming of the mind. So that's called a monk who is absorbed in recitation, but not one who dwells in the Dhamma. And then the fourth case, again, you could see exactly the same kind of wording is used. The monk is one who ponders, examines, and mentally inspects the Dhamma as he has heard it and learned it. And he passes the day in thinking about the Dhamma, but he doesn't devote himself to internal calming of the mind. So that's one who is absorbed in thought, but not one who dwells in the Dhamma. Then finally, we have the one who dwells in the Dhamma. So here we have one who learns the Dhamma, but does not pass the day solely in learning the Dhamma, but devotes himself to internal serenity of mind. And we could also, even though the sutta doesn't mention this, we could say that the monk teaches the Dhamma to others in detail as he has heard and learned it, but doesn't pass the day solely in teaching the Dhamma to others. And similarly, we could have that the monk recites the Dhamma as he has heard it and learned it, but he doesn't just pass day after day reciting the Dhamma, but he'll go off for periods of seclusion and in that per those periods of seclusion, devote himself to internal serenity of mind. And then we can have a monk who does ponder, examine, and reflect intellectually on the Dhamma, but who also devotes himself to internal serenity of mind. So that is how one, the monk is one who dwells in the Dhamma. And then the Buddha ends this by saying that whatever has been, should be done by a compassionate teacher out of compassion for his disciples, that I have done for you. Here are the roots of trees. These are empty huts. Meditate. Do not be heedless and do not have reason to regret it later. That's my instruction to you. And then the next sutta is parallel to that, similar in all respects. Except in this case, okay, we have the monk learns the Dhamma and so on and so on. But what makes him one who dwells in the Dhamma is that he goes further and understands the meaning with wisdom. So this would be the way I understand it. This sutta would be referring to probably the meditator who gives emphasis to vipassana to insight meditation, whereas the previous sutta will be describing the meditator who gives emphasis to samatha meditation, to the meditation of calming the mind aimed at samadhi. But eventually, both calmness and insight, samatha and vipassana, are necessary. Okay, so if we have the meditator, if we have the monk who's devoted to all of the other things, but not to calmness and insight, he's not one who dwells in the Dhamma. And though the activities he's engaged in, teaching the Dhamma, reciting the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma, um, reflecting on the Dhamma, although those activities can become bases for liberation, if they are not accompanied by the mental attitude of being ardent, heedful, and resolute, and not being accompanied by dedication to the practice of calming and insight, they won't be bases of liberation. Okay, maybe we could see if there are some questions. Okay, let us see the way to ask the question. Let me just, okay, I see some questions already. 
I'll take them in order. In the way, if you want to ask a question, what you do is to click the raise hand icon. Okay, first is Yudi. Yeah, hi Bante, good morning. Hi. Good morning. So in the, for the second sutta 73, uh, one who dwells in the Dhamma, it, 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 it sounds to me like it's, this is only uh, for probably for, for monks, not for um, regular practi practitioners, because like number five, it says learns the Dhamma, but does not teach the Dhamma and does not devote himself to internal serenity. So as a regular practitioner, does that apply to regular practitioners? Well, it's formulated in way, yeah, it's formulated in ways that would be sort of more sort of in line with the special duty or activities of monks. But I'd also say that as far as like living by Dharma, dwelling by Dharma, also lay people should also, you know, find the, the practices particular for lay people and follow those practices. And they will also be Dhamma Vihari, living by the Dhamma. So that would include observing the silas, following the precepts, and if one wants to advance further on the path, devoting some time every day to a meditation practice, whether it's the samatha, a calming meditation, or vipassana, insight meditation. Yeah. In fact. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, it just came to mind. I I remember a sutta, but I don't remember where it's located, where the Buddha is describing the practice appropriate for lay people. I think it also will come up in the Anguttara Nikaya Book of Fives. It's given to Anatta Pindika. I'll see if I can locate it later, but I don't want to start searching now. Okay, great. Thank you. But Appreciate there are it. such suttas, yeah. I remember he says that Anatta Pindika together with a group of his friends come to see the Buddha. And the Buddha says to them that it could be that you lay people are, you know, you say that you're my followers, but you just spend all of your time dealing with your family affairs, with your business affairs, but you don't go off into seclusion and devote some time to the practice. So he, he says that that is not really the way to truly be a follower of mine. And then the Buddha goes on to say that the true follower of mine will go off and devote some effort, make some effort. I think he mentioned some of the recollections, like the recollection of the Buddha, recollection of the Dhamma, recollection of the Sangha. Okay, because I, I feel like um, like uh, like a, a Lasalle follower, I feel like, okay, I can do the, I do most of the, uh, let's say the seclusion meditation and uh, learning the Dhamma, but um, we don't, I mean, I, I wouldn't feel confident to, to teach the Dhamma. <laughs> Yeah, that that you don't have to worry about that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, there are there are lay people who are quite good, accomplished teachers of the Dhamma. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bante. Okay. So next we have Gita. Thank you, Bante. I just wanted to thank you. What a beautiful sutta. So thank you. <laughs> okay. We are so blessed to have you among us and teaching <laughs> okay. this profound teaching. I just love it. And Bhante, you know, I incorporate all of this every day. Yeah. Okay, so it was good. so nice to hear. Thanks again, Bhante. We're so lucky. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then we have next is Ch Changhua. Yes. Uh... Good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Yes, I have been bothered by this, this similar sentence, like the body become tranquil. Yeah. This body means physical body or mental body? I, I take it to be both, it, but it's really the mind becomes tranquil. But when the, the body and mind are very, very integrally interconnected, so when the the mind becomes calm and tranquil. That tranquility sort of emphasize, uh, influences the body. 
So normally, if we pay close attention to the body in our day-to-day -day activities, we could see like little instances of agitation, even like the nerve currents seem to be a bit jarred and restless and agitated. And so, you know, when even when you like sit down after a busy day, you sit down for meditation and there's sort of itching, twitching, uh, the body is a bit jittery. But then once you'd sort of get into the flow of the meditation object, then that calmness settles on the mind and the calmness spreads from the mind to the body. And so you could actually feel a sensation in the body of like a physical sensation of calmness and tranquility. Yeah, so that would be my understanding. Yeah, uh, just, just a follow up question. Uh, you know, when our body has autonomous nerve system, which means yeah. we call reflection, like yeah. when I touch it, a hot, hot stuff, I just put it back without thinking. Yeah. Does this reflection involve chitta or chitasika function or it's just, just reflection? I don't quite understand. It's when we touch a, a very hot stuff, like 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 fire. We yeah. we pull our hand back. Yeah. Is there any chitta or chitasika involved in this pulling back, or just your body does it by itself? Yeah, of course there will be sort of mental activity involved. Okay. Yeah, when it, but but probably it occurs that I would say. It probably occurs at a pre-conceptual level before you even conceptualize heat. Just the impact of the heat is felt at the level of body consciousness before conceptual consciousness arises. So you mean this only happens in the five senses level? It will immediately respond. Doesn't really go to the what the uh, the, the, the mind consciousness. The mind consciousness level. It, It'll come to mind consciousness, but the body responds first on the base of sense consciousness. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Sud. Thank you, Bhante, for the teaching. Um, I just wanted to ask, so what does, I mean, practically speaking, what does uh, ardent resolute mean? I mean, does it mean following the Eightfold Path fully or, or does that mean you hear the teaching and go and meditate on the teaching and sit? and uh, ponder about it. What exactly does being hard and resolute, I mean, it's just not entirely clear. Yeah, it means that one is, the way I understand it, it means that the practitioner who's being described here is one who throughout the day is engaged in sort of training the mind through mindfulness, clear comprehension as being aware of what one is doing in all activities and is applying energy to the task of training the mind whenever like unwholesome states of mind arise they'll make the effort to remove those states gotcha. thank you so much okay yeah it's not we can't sort of pinpoint it into something very very specific but the three words together indicate a kind of, we call this like a dedication to the practice, a strong commitment to the practice. So that one has the kind of mind that one is in training in a process of training, seeking to purify the mind. So I guess, could you say it's like following the Eightfold Path? Well, the Eightfold the Path is quite broad, um, but I wouldn't want to tie it so specifically to the Eightfold Path, but just in the general sense, I'd say it involves the combined functioning of mindfulness, clear awareness, and energy in training and disciplining the mind. Maybe of the Eightfold Path, I would say it involves especially the interplay of right effort and right mindfulness. Gotcha, thank you so much. Okay, Heinz, Heinz. Yeah, good morning, Bhante. Good morning. Um, the sequence, inspiration, joy, rapture, tranquility, pleasure, concentration, does that describe the person established in the jhanas? 
the sutta itself doesn't make any reference to the jhanas, but actually those are elsewhere we find those that particular sequence of stages. Well, elsewhere we find them leading to samadhi. So that those uh, factors that are mentioned consistently lead to samadhi. Whether that samadhi must be of the level of the jhana or not, that's another issue. And it's not dealt with in the sutta itself. But it <laughs> describes a person with a higher level of concentration. Yeah, well, it culminates in, in samadhi. So it says that the mind becomes concentrated. So that person with the high level of concentration can use any of the five. What, what surprises me is that the five bases don't seem to be, or, or do they in your mind, uh, are they um, ordered in a hierarchical fashion from low to high, or are they equivalent to each other? You know, the teaching, the recitation, um, mm -hmm. the pondering, the penetration with wisdom, are they? Um, I, I don't. I don't see a higher, a hierarchical order amongst okay. them. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Okay. 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 Next, Alvina. Oh, good morning, Bante. Good thank morning. you very much for the class today, uh, Bante. Um, and this is a more practical kind of question. Maybe it's the answer is referred to elsewhere. But if we pierce through the five aggregates, uh, does the object disappear? No, the object won't disappear. There'll always be some object. Okay, man. thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so now what I want to do is just briefly look at one more sutta. And this is the sutta on mindful, on walking meditation. And this, I think, might be one of the unique features of the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha's yoga or meditation practice. Because I don't think in any of the Indian, the other Indian meditation systems, like the yoga system of Patanjali um, or Jainism, that one finds walking meditation. But in, especially in Theravada Buddha, well, also Theravada Zen meditation as well, one finds walking meditation include, included as a regular feature. And one of the bases for that emphasis on walking meditation is this little sutta, just, just a few lines, in which the sutta speaks of five benefits of walking meditation. And the word here rendered as walking meditation, it doesn't actually include a word which means meditation, but it's chankama, which is based on the verb kamati, which means to take a step or to walk. And when it's intensified with the prefix chang, it comes to mean walking back and forth. But when it's not just walking back and forth as a kind of physical exercise, but one is doing it as a meditative exercise. And so the Buddha here mentions five benefits of the walking meditation. And the first is that one becomes capable of taking long journeys because it's through the walking meditation that one you know, gets, you know, builds up stamina, builds up strength in the body so that when one has to take a long journey, one can do so. And we have to remember that in the Buddha's time, you know, when monks were going from town to town, from city to city, they didn't get in a car or take a bus or a train, but the only way to travel was to walk there. And so we know that the Buddha would have traveled all over Northeast India from an area probably close to present day Calcutta, even as far as present day New Delhi. And so they, they would be traveling probably eight months out of a year, they would be traveling, going on long journeys. And so the practice, when you're settled for a longer period of time in one place, the practice of walking meditation builds up the capacity for walking long distances. And then the 
the second benefit is that one becomes capable of striving. So this is a kind of, I think the idea here is not immediately clear to me, but I think the idea is that there are some practitioners who devote long periods to walking meditation. So sometimes even three or four hours of straight walking meditation. And so you build up the walking meditation, maybe doing shorter periods, maybe half an hour, an hour of walking meditation. And then as one becomes familiar with it, then one could do the walking meditation for three, four, five hours. And as you do the walk, too many people here in the, especially in the West think real meditation is sitting meditation, that you just use the walking just to break up the period of sitting. But actually, if you do long periods of walking meditation, applying serious mindfulness to the process of walking, that mindfulness can develop a very, very high degree of precision, facility, attention to detail, so that one could see through the walking meditation, get very rapidly get insights into, especially into impermanence, into the arising change and passing away of phenomena. So, so that's the third benefit. One becomes capable of this vigorous striving through walking meditation. One becomes healthy, and this is especially valuable for us because we're so accustomed to a sedentary way of life but through walking, maybe the Buddha intended this for monks who were hanging out at the established monasteries, not traveling from town to town, and maybe devoting too much time just to sitting meditation or to recitation of texts, and they would easily become sick. So doing the walking meditation is a way to improve the health, and then doing the walking meditation, particularly after meals, helps to facilitate digestion. And then this is the important point, the last one, that the concentration gained through walking meditation is long lasting. Like what happens when you're doing sitting meditation, you might gain samadhi, some good concentration, but then when you, the period comes to an end, you drop the meditation object, you get up, and then you start getting immersed in your day-to-day -day activities and you've forgotten the concentration of the mind. But when you do walking meditation, you're building up concentration in the midst of activity. <clears throat> Even if you're not gaining a deep samadhi, but you're building up through the walking meditation, you're building up sati sampajanya, mindfulness and clear awareness. So then when you switch from the walking meditation into other activities, you go maybe to take a meal, you have to maybe type some emails or interact with other people, you maintain the mindfulness and clear comprehension in the midst of the other activities. So those are the five benefits of walking meditation. And for this reason, in many monasteries, the, the layout of the monastery will include a walkway, which is especially dedicated to the practice of the walking meditation. And I want to share Is this the one that I want? No, that's myself. Whoops. Okay, this is what I want.
Do you see? Do you see the the image on the screen of monks doing walking meditation? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma ah, okay. Did it change? Did you see the change? Yes, Bhante. Yes. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, so this is, I think, this is Nisarana Vanaya. That's the monastery of Venerable Dhamma Jiva, who would come here to give meditation retreats. So you could see that there are walking paths where the monks are doing the walking meditation. This is just another shot. So each one has a the fairly long paths, probably about 30, 30 meters each. There's an individual monk on his walking path. Yeah, this is a high view. You could see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten walking paths. Oh, that's a sitting meditation. And uh, there was another one. Did it change the view? No, yes, we see. Yes, Bante. Do you see the forest walking path? Yes. Yes, Bante. Oh, okay. With the kudi, a little hut. Yes, yes a, a on, Okay, so okay, so you do see it then. Yeah. So this is a, a another way in which the walking paths are constructed. So the one that we the one that we saw at Nisaranavania, there are a whole series of walking paths, right one right next to the other. But in some monasteries, like this, must be a maybe a Thai style forest monastery. The monks are spread out in the forest each with their own individual hut. And each hut will have next to it an outdoor walking path. When I was at Nisaranavania, there was both an outdoor walking path and in, inside, as part of the hut itself, there was like a porch with a walking path on the porch. Yeah, do you see another one now? This is a, a, a lay woman, the woman wearing white. Yes, Bante. Yes, Bante. Yeah, so this is not a specific walking path, but it's just like a, a what do they call this, a cloister? It's probably in a temple, in a monastery, where she's using that that a pathway of the of the temple as a place for doing walking meditation. Yeah, so there are many ways to do the walking meditation. Yeah, it looks like here, it looks like these are like little nuns, I think, walking in a line along a walking path. So many different styles of walking meditation in Buddhism. Okay, I think, any questions about the sutta? Or about the walking meditation. Okay, then I think we'll have to end for the day. So let us end with the sharing, the dedication of the merits. And particularly, we should all be very concerned what is happening now, terrible in the eastern part of Ukraine and the threat that's come this past week from Russia to use, even the threat to use nuclear weapons. So very serious danger of a even nuclear weapons being used on, in Europe. So we should dedicate our merits to the establishment of peace in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. Ah, kasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mehidika punyantung anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu desanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika 
punyantang anumo ditva chirang rakantu mang parang. I should have mentioned also this buddhaweekly.com. If you look up walking meditation there, there's a little video by a Canadian monk called Yuta Dhammo, which gives good instructions on basic walking meditation. So you could look for buddhaweekly.com, just search walking meditation. And then I think you'll get this page and you'll get the video with instructions on walking meditation. Someplace here. I think maybe also the method of Thich Nhat Hanh, who also emphasizes walking meditation. Okay, then continuing the sharing of the merits. Dukkha patajani dukkha, baya patajani baya, soka patajani soka, hantu sabepi panino. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. There we go. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bow to Bhante. To Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. 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 Be safe, Bante. Take care of your health. Be safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bante. Take care. Thank you, Bante. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bante. Okay, I'll have to go up now for the meal. Bye, Bante. Thank you, Bante. Take care, Bante. Okay, take care. Nice meal.